This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with uh, Thomas Fertlin. He has been on the podcast before, uh, a long time ago. We were just checking episode 69, so almost two years ago. And Thomas is, uh, what, de- is the developer of one of the most popular and widely used uh, Bitcoin wallets. Actually, we at Epicenter use it as well, called Electrum, um, which is a well-known SPV wallet, desktop wallet, two-factor authentication, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and yeah, so he's he's here today, so we can speak a bit about what's going on in Bitcoin, what's going on with uh, Bitcoin Unlimited, user-activated soft fork, scaling, all of those things. We haven't been covering it so much, so we're gonna try to cover it a little bit more in the in the coming coming future, because certainly like, lots has been going on, lots of very um, interesting stuff, but also complicated stuff and it changes so quickly it's really hard to keep track of you know what exactly is the status so yeah thanks so much thomas yeah well thank you for having me so, yeah so taking a step back right we have it, it's actually hard to remember sometimes like when did this whole controversy start about scaling bitcoin and about the block size so can you maybe from your perspective give a little bit of background about what has been going on? Um, you know, how did we get here, and, and what's the situation today? I think it's it's always been there, kind of, uh, but it was not so important at the beginning because the blocks were not full. And uh, I think also uh, uh, an important moment was the publication of, about the Lightning Network paper. Uh, when this was published, I I was really convinced that this was the way to go. Uh, before that paper, I didn't have a, a very strong opinion um, because uh, both uh, sides have uh, good arguments, actually. Um, but yeah, well, uh, Lightning was really uh, a breakthrough, in at least on the theoretical point of view, because it hasn't been uh, uh, used on the Bitcoin network for the moment. So. But this was the the moment where I I got uh, really convinced that uh, we have to use uh, segregated business uh, as a as a scaling uh, solution. Well, I mean, Segwit was was developed after the definition of Lightning, but um, it's uh, it's one of the reasons why I think uh, segregated business is a, is the best uh, option. So you mean that you know there there was different views about how to scale Bitcoin with some people saying off you know on chain we just need to increase the blocks it happens on there versus other people being more okay it has to be layers and then with Lightning it became clear to you on chain scaling is um, the problem with that is that you never know when to stop you you don't know what is the right size of blocks uh, the bigger the blocks are the bigger you you have a danger of centralization. And it's very difficult to, to quantify this. Yeah, w- the problem with bigger blocks is that they take longer time to propagate in the Bitcoin network and to validate. And uh, it, it means that uh, miners who are not well connected have an increased risk of uh, mining blocks that eventually will be orphaned because someone else in the meantime has mined another block. Um, and in addition to that, of course, since you have bigger blocks, you need more resources in order to validate them. Yeah, this this whole idea of scaling on chain has never really uh, been a solution. In addition, if we can scale off chain, uh, we probably ha- have already big enough blocks. If we were if if we were using the Lightning Network, I don't know what would be the the block requirement for the number of people who use Bitcoin currently. I doubt that uh, one megabyte is too small. So that's that's a great point, right? That maybe we can dive in a little bit. So I think there's no discussion that at some point bigger blocks create the centralization problem, right? And that you know uh, massive blocks, you know, w- would create a problem. I think everybody's in agreement about that. I think where yeah. there's a disagreement on, or, or where there's a question is about, you know, what's what's the right size of a block? Is it one megabyte? Is it 
I don't know, two, four, eight? Is it something bigger? Some people, I think, have even said something smaller. How should we determine that number? I think uh, the question is, do we want a hard fork or not? Because increasing the block size is a hard fork. Um, and uh, if we can avoid this uh, by using another scaling method that is probably superior because it can handle m much more transactions, orders of magnitude more, then there is no, there is no point uh, trying to determine the, the block size for the moment. We don't know what the, I mean, what is the right block size depends on how, how you, use, you use the blockchain. But if you use the blockchain using Lightning, then uh, the right block size is probably is not something that uh, is the same as if you don't use it. And we cannot measure that for the moment because we don't know the, the usage of uh, Lightning. We don't know how many people would use it and uh, how many channels would need to be open with the current user base. So two things on this. Uh, I think everybody basically agrees that even on Lightning, or, or maybe you have a different point of view here, that bigger blocks will be needed and that you know opening and closing channels also requires making transactions. And, and, and the other thing is it's not ready yet, so why not increase it in the meantime while Lightning is developed and then you know when it's there, you will see. Okay, I, I need to make three parts to my answer. First, uh, the claim that uh, we need more, we need big, bigger blocks, even with Lightning, is only. Uh, I mean, it has been made in the context of uh, every human on Earth using Bitcoin, which is clearly not the case today. We don't even know if it's going to happen. So instead of solving a problem that never, that might never happen, uh, let's just uh, try to solve the problem that we have now, and we will see later if we need to increase the block size. Again, uh, SegWit is a soft fork. It's less risky than uh, than uh, risking a, a split of the blockchain. So uh, it's potentially much more powerful and less risky. You know, whether bigger blocks wouldn't be needed even with Lightning, and Lightning isn't ready, but the blocks are full today, right? I think it is ready. Uh, it's not ready in the graphical user interface. Um, but if we activate SegWit now, we will already gain some space. So it will relieve uh, the, the space issue that we have for the moment uh, scaling on-chain. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Lightning uh, solutions for end users will appear soon. In your opinion, why are some people opposed to SegWit? What, uh, what might be the reasons why? Because it, you know, it all seems like, seems like a good idea. It's an easy solution. It, it, it offers some scaling. It solves um, known issues like uh, transaction malleability. Yeah, why, well, why would uh, anybody not want this? Well, there are different categories of uh, users who want different things. Uh, let's uh, set aside the miners and the ASIC boost issue for the moment, and let's talk about uh, developers and users. Uh, some people want to have a scaling on-chain because this is how Bitcoin used to work. Uh, we used to have a few years ago almost free transactions, I mean with zero fees. And Bitcoin was working in a very different regime as it's working today um, and as it will work in the future. Uh, because uh, with uh, fees that are almost zero, you also need to find an incentive for miners to mine since the block reward is, is supposed to go to, towards zero, uh, miners have to make money out of fees. This is uh, how Bitcoin is, was designed. Uh, other blockchains have been designed differently. For example, with Ethereum, you have inflation forever, which is, a, is also a reasonable choice. But that's not the choice that was made in the design of uh, Bitcoin. So I think that um, the people who want be bigger blocks are actually extremely uh, nostalgic of the, I mean, they, they are conservative in the sense that they want to, to go back to the past uh, way of uh, functioning of Bitcoin. But it's not clear for me that uh, this is a sustainable thing because uh, it would require some inflation. It would require uh, uh, rewarding the miners for, for mining blocks, in my opinion. Yeah, and so, so this, uh, this is a category of users. Now, if yeah, I said we leave aside miners for the moment. The third category would be developers. And of course, if you 
uh, want to propose a, a fork of Bitcoin with bigger blocks, it might also because you want to be uh, part of the leading team. So that might be uh, another reason. Yeah. So moving to uh, the, the topic of scalability and, and mining perhaps bigger blocks, uh, one topic that has been very present in this, in this whole debate recently, even if you uh, only follow this debate from a distance, is Bitcoin Unlimited. Of course, we've had uh, Roger Ver on the show to talk about that, as well as... Um, Peter Risen and, yeah, and, Peter and Risen. The, the two Andrews who are the, the main... That's right. Leaders so, of um, so you know, if you, if listeners want to uh, learn more about Bitcoin Limited, you know, they can go back and listen to those episodes. Um, currently, so you know, like Bitcoin Unlimited had seemed to gain quite a bit of traction in the beginning, and and it's still very much a topic a topic of conversation in the community. It seems like it's currently at about forty percent of the mining power. If we look at uh, uh, if we look at the support, what do you think of Bitcoin Unlimited, uh, Thomas? Yeah, well, um, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, it's really a big change. Uh, it's, it's a change in the structure of power of Bitcoin. And it's, um, it's a very risky hard fork. Um, but I, I also think it's not a topic anymore because uh, a lot of people have been, uh, uh, with this ASIC book uh, scandal, sort of, uh, a lot of people uh, have uh, changed their mind on this. Um, there is still a, a large fraction of the hashing power that is uh, signaling for, for Bitcoin Unlimited. Uh, but we are in a situation where miners uh, have a lot of power and uh, they seem to, to want more. Do you think that this um, these 40% of miners that are backing Bitcoin Unlimited, do you think that this is... So the threshold that it's it's not going to go any further than because I mean it it requires seventy five percent in order to uh, to be adopted uh, is that a probability? It will be up to the miners to decide when they start. Yeah, exactly. Right? The, the 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 fork can be triggered at any time, and that's the point of uh, of Bitcoin Unlimited. It's the miners who decide to change the rules whenever they want, and they they can uh, they can do it. Uh, the only requirement is that they get uh, they are followed by other miners. Um, so the this emergent consensus uh, works by trying to fork and see uh, see if other people follow you, uh, and if they don't, you get off hands. That's uh, that's how it works. You mentioned this briefly as well. You know that they want more power. I think. If you look at this whole debate, I think on on every side actually, we are. Yeah, yeah. There there has been the claim that the miners are trying to fire the the core dev, the the core development team with a BU, and to replace them with other developers. And on the other side, the what seems to be the the nuclear trigger is a change of proof of work. This uh, this threat that has been also agitated uh, by uh, Luke Dashteria. I don't know about that. Could you could you could you talk about this uh, threat of a change of proof of work? I I don't exactly remember what he said, but the idea is that uh, okay, we can hard fork Bitcoin and uh, use something different, a different proof of work than SHA two fifty six, which would make the mine the 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 material bought by the miners obsolete. Well, I I think it came from there. Like so, let's say you'd have a hard fork, and you know Bitcoin Unlimited is at whatever fifty, sixty percent or something, and and there is a hard fork, and then there's some minority that stays on on a different chain. You know, they say okay, you know, we stay with one megabyte blocks. Of course, what the situation you have then is that the the minority chain uh, is potentially vulnerable to miners uh, on the majority chain saying, okay, we're going to attack that chain you know, by yeah. mining empty blocks or orphaning blocks or something like that. So then I think the, the sort of proposal was made by some that, uh, you know, if there is a hard fork, they could potentially change the proof of work so that uh, the, the minority chain wouldn't be vulnerable anymore to attacks from miners. Yes, indeed. Um... But in both cases, we are talking about uh, a situation of, uh, of a very big disruption uh, if, there is a, yeah. if there is a split of the blockchain. 
consciousness. Absolutely. I mean, massive, it, it probably, I mean, in that case, right, you probably actually end up with three Bitcoins, right? Because you might have a Bitcoin unlimited chain, you might have a minority chain with still the same proof of work, and then you might have some that then change your proof of work, right? So. Yeah, of course. Uh, honestly, I don't think that the miners uh, who currently signal for Bitcoin Unlimited uh, really want that. They are signaling their opposition to, to SegWit. So why are they opposed to SegWit? Yeah, well, there is this uh, theory that uh, it's um, because it's not compatible with uh, ASIC Boost. So uh, Greg Maxwell made this... Uh, this statement um, on uh, on the mailing list uh, a few days ago. Um, so uh, apparently, the main uh, chip producer, Bitmain, uh, has uh, incorporated in the chips a technique and optimization that is called ASIC Boost uh, that allows to mine more efficiently. And uh, this is not compatible with segregated PPs. So if they have done that, uh, if they are, I mean, they have acknowledged that they, they have a ASIC boost in the chips. There is no question about that. Uh, but they always, uh, they keep saying that they never use it on the main network. It was only on testnet. If you want to, to have a, a competitive advantage over other miners by doing that, uh, it only works, of course, if uh, you don't tell the other miners that uh, you are using this uh, optimization on the chip because they are selling those chips to other miners. So it means that uh, we are talking about a situation where miners buy a chip and they are not using uh, the, the complete set of features of that chip. Only, only the producer give, keeps this uh, feature for himself. Yeah, I, I mean, this is a complicated topic, right? And uh, it's just, I, I was reading a fair bit about that and, and there was articles by you know, several mining manufacturers, so the X, Guy Sam Cole who's running KNC Miner, the guy who's running uh, Spondulis Tech. Uh, he also had a discussion with Adam Back about it. Uh, also Timo Hanke, and and, uh, and and they sort of all seem to say, yeah, I mean, it, it's not such a massive thing. You know, maybe there will be improvements of fifteen percent or something like that. But fifty percent is already the margin 15. that they. Yeah, fifteen. I mean, uh, it's your margin. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the arguments for most of the people who are actually working in mining was that this is unlikely to be a significant advantage. Okay, I, I am not a miner and I'm not able to, to put numbers on, uh, on the economic advantage that they can gain from it. However, uh, this, uh, some call, uh, this, uh, this blog post by, by some call uh, did not convince me at all. Uh, he's uh, debunking arguments that have not been made by Craig Maxwell. He's talking about um, how, how you can reduce the number of gates on the chip and how you can gain uh, 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 power efficiency. But uh, the claim of Craig is only about the power efficiency. Uh, if, you, if you want to save on the number of gates of the chips, you cannot produce a chip that you can sell to other miners without telling them. This is, uh, this is not possible. And they, so, so uh, Greg did not make that claim. And uh, yeah, well, he also has a whole paragraph about pre-processing on the chip, which is uh, not relevant for the discussion. Yeah. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is your wallet, your complete user interface to cover all your blockchain needs. I've been using it and I've been loving it. Now, Jax supports a lot of different cryptocurrencies. I suppose Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Ethereum Classic, Zcash, Augur Rep, and they're adding many more. Keep responding to users' needs. Now, with Jax, the nice thing is that you can manage all of those coins within a single wallet and you are in control of your own private keys. They're not on their server. And there's a single 12 word seed that you can use to back up your wallet, all your coins and sync them across different devices. Talking about devices, they're on pretty much any device that you can think of. You can get it on PC, Mac, Linux. You can get it on smartphones like Android and Apple and iPhone. You can get it on tablets or even, there are even browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And on top of that, in JAX, you can actually exchange different cryptocurrencies for each other because they've integrated a shapeshift. 
and more partnerships and integrations are coming down the line in 2017 that are going to make JAX even better. So JAX is really making blockchain and cryptocurrencies accessible for the masses, easy to use for the masses. Make sure to, sure to get your own JAX wallet at JAX.io or you can get it from any of the app stores you are using. We'd like to thank JAX for their support of Epicenter. So just, just coming back to the Bitcoin Unlimited topic. Okay, so you know, one can understand quite quite simply why, uh, what, what interests are at odds here with regards to segregated witness and ASIC boost um, because they're simply incompatible and, and you know, miners have, their, have an interest in mining blocks more efficiently. Um, where, where, where does segregated witness and Bitcoin Unlimited uh, collide in terms of, uh, are, they, are, they, are they incompatible? Why, why are these two proposals uh, seem to, why do these two proposals seem to be opposed? You mean uh, SegWit and uh, ASIC Boost? Or no, SegWit and, and Bitcoin Unlimited. The team of developers that uh, are behind uh, Bitcoin Unlimited actually did not create a patch of the project, but they forked it a long time ago. And uh, the, the, the version of Bitcoin that they maintain is now completely different. They have diverged, which is not a good idea. I mean, if you, if you want to... to uh, well, it's a good idea to fork the project if you actually want to replace the developers, if you want to fire them. But if you want to do something constructive and to keep gaining and benefiting from their development, you, you, you should not do that. You, they should have uh, created a, a patch or a new branch that they would rebase from time to time. So, th uh, I mean, th that's why it's not compatible. Okay, so it's it, it has nothing to do with technical incompatibility. It's what you're saying. Is well, I think it's, 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 it's it somewhat has to political. do with uh, the choice made by these developers. Yeah, I mean, we were having this discussion, Ryan and I, early before the show, and you know, the, what he pointed out is that a lot of this is just it just comes down to power. I mean, who who's going to get their patch out? Who's going to get their version uh, out? And it seems like this here is one 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 example of that where. Uh, you have these two opposing camps that uh, are um, trying to achieve, uh, to gain power and achieve uh, some sort of power. Uh, yeah, but, but the Bitcoin the Unlimited camp is uh, just, uh, I don't know how many people, but it's, uh, it's very small. I mean, it's not really a, a, a big uh, team of people. Uh, at least uh, I'm talking about the developers. We talked a bit about ASIC boost and I, I'm personally, I don't really, I'm not sure I buy that this is really what's going on here and that there isn't, you know, some deeper issues or some deeper conflicts that uh, are, are at the heart of this and that are preventing there, you know, from any kind of conflict being reached. Do, do, can you see other reasons why we have this division in the community and why there is this disagreement and unwillingness from both sides. There might be the idea that uh, if you have larger blocks, uh, you can earn more on transaction fees because you have more transactions. Um, on the other hand, if you have the Lightning Network, miners might uh, actually uh, make less uh, transaction fees uh, because they, they do not get any fee on, the, on whatever goes on the Lightning Network, they would only make uh, money on the transactions that are opening and closing a channel. So this might also be a, a reason, but today it's impossible to, to, set, to put numbers on that. It's not possible to quantify this. Um, it's, only, it's probably a fear of these miners. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you make this point because, I mean, we've had various discussions about blocks I see even a long time ago. And back then the argument was always uh, we need to have a block size limit and full blocks in order for miners to make more money from fees. And it's interesting how this is like turned around now and, you know, sort of telling miners, oh, they want bigger blocks to make more money from fees, which is, was exactly the opposite argument. Yeah, that's why I'm saying it, uh, it's impossible to really quantify this. And uh, I'm not... Uh... I'm not convinced by this argument. I'm just saying that it might be one of the reasons why they fear that. Uh, but talking about ASIC boosts, if the main chip manufacturer is opposed to, to, to SegWit and uh, he sells you your chip, he can also uh, pressure you not to signal for, for SegWit. Uh, so uh, 
it might be as simple as that. So now let's let's talk about the uh, the topic of a fork. I think we we have kind of approached on it a little bit, but I would love to dive in deeper. First of all, you know how could a fork to play out with uh, with Bitcoin Unlimited, and and then uh, also what has now come up as a topic, the the idea of a user activated soft fork. So uh, first of all, you know let's just assume yeah Bitcoin Unlimited got to sixty percent. Yeah. They start mining bigger blocks. Uh, you know, what happens then, for example, for me as a user uh, or for the Bitcoin core developer, how, how does this play out, this scenario? Okay, so UASF is a soft fork and Bitcoin Unlimited is a hard fork. The distinction uh, between them is that uh, with a soft fork, you are uh, making the rules more strict, the, the rules of the consensus. So uh, something that used to be allowed is no longer allowed. With a hard fork, uh, you are relaxing the rules. Uh, this is the, the traditional distinction. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not a complete picture because you have two different types of hard forks, actually. You can have a strict relaxing of the rules and you can have also uh, a change of the rules where some, uh, some of the, the rules are relaxed and others are, are new. And this would also be a hard fork. Uh, Bitcoin Unlimited is on the is not of that type. It, it's a, it's a strict relaxing of the rules, and uh, this makes it reversible. It means that uh, if their branch, if there is a, a, a split of the blockchain and their branch has less uh, less proof of work, it gets off banned, which is not a, a good design. Um, because then it it will be forever threatened to be off band. Yeah. So so what you mean is like we have uh, we have um, a fork that is re it is reversible. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a fork now. We have Bitcoin Unlimited and we have some Bitcoin Core or something we can call them, right? And uh, and even if maybe sixty percent of the hashing power is on Bitcoin Unlimited, if later they switch to the other chain. And that one ends up becoming longer, then you would have the Bitcoin uh, unlimited nodes. I mean, unless they do some sort of upgrade to change that. Presumably. Yeah, yeah, unless they do some sort of upgrade. But still, so, so let's say, you know, we had this with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic that there was a split, there was two coins. Is there a similar scenario? For example, how would you, if, if, if I as a user, there's, there's this fork and I want to sell one of my one of my coins and let's say i hold it with electrum what do i do yeah you need to split your coins before you you sell them so uh, splitting them means to protect them against uh, replay so that when you do a transaction on one of the blockchains uh, the transaction cannot be played on the other blockchain um, and in order to do that the safest way to do it is to to mix your bitcoins with a newly mine coins that exist only on one of the chains. Um, but of course, uh, it's also a bit slow. So this is why I suggested that uh, you could also achieve the same goal using uh, replace by fee, because BU turns out to uh, not support RBF, but it's not 100% guaranteed to work. Yeah, I mean, the, so, their so miners can, can mine RBF. So yeah, so, so just to run through that, let's say I have a, a Bitcoin uh, in a particular address, and now there's a split. And I want to I wanna make sure that I spend it on the you know Bitcoin core chain, but not on the Bitcoin Unlimited chain. Uh, and then what I could do is yeah. So so what you, what you would do is uh, you would duplicate your Electrum wallet to have two separate directories. It's uh, it's cleaner that way. And uh, it's then um, you send the bitcoins to yourself uh, using the the Bitcoin Core wallet. Uh, and for this you you use a RBF transaction. Um, and then uh, you bump the fee of this RBF transaction. Um, and if, if everything uh, works well, uh, the fee, uh, I mean, the transaction will be on the other version of the chain, but not when you bump the fee because it's non-standard for them. Uh, it's not guaranteed to work, so, so uh, you would need to wait until transactions are confirmed on both chains and to verify that the transaction ID is different. 
I'm saying it's not guaranteed to work because their miners can always uh, mine the, the second transaction if they do not follow their own rules. Couldn't you make a transaction that in the inputs also includes newly minted coins from after the fork? Is, is that essentially? Yeah, you, you, yeah. That's, that's just slower because you need to wait until uh, these coins are coins. mature. So they, they need to be, to be uh, 100 uh, blocks old. And then you need to find a miner that sells them to you. So you, if you want to trade them very quickly, uh, it's, it's it can be a problem if you if you really want to use uh, the coins very soon. And and just just to explain this uh, replaced by fee thing, uh, you mentioned again a bit more. So yeah, so I have my coin now. I have it in these two electron wallets, right? I am sending. Uh, this transaction to myself, right? Uh, in in both networks, uh, yeah. but I mar I mark it uh, replaced by fee. Which is that like a sort of a flag on a transaction, or how is that transaction different from a regular transaction? Yeah, it differs uh, because there is a, a special uh, flag on the input. Okay. Um, and uh, this RBF transaction actually is accepted on both networks. What is not accepted is the the action of bumping the fee. So that means that uh, both transactions are actually valid on both uh, networks. Uh, and this is why I'm saying it's not 100% safe. In order to be safe, you, you need to check after the fact that the transaction IDs are different on both uh, networks. Right. Because So basically, I would be saying, OK, I'm going to send on, on both chains, I'm going to send you know, from my address A, I'm going to send it to B. I'm remarking this to replace by fee, and then on the core chain, I'm going to replace that transaction, sending it to C. So no, no, you, you still send to yourself, but you just increase the fee. You bump the fee. So you create a first version of the transaction that is from yourself to yourself with a low fee. And then uh, what you can do actually is bump the fee right away. And uh, in theory, th this transaction would not be propagated on the BU network. If that uh, doesn't work, what you can do also do is uh, wait until it's, on, it's confirmed on BU because BU has bigger blocks, so it will be faster. And then once it's confirmed on BU and unconfirmed on Bitcoin, you can bump the fee. That's another solution. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But of course, it won't work if uh, by chance your transaction is confirmed instantly on both. So, so, but if you see that playing out, right? Like, let's say we have this fork, we have uh, people on both chains. I mean, realistically, a fork would mean a tremendous amount of volatility, right? People would yeah. be trading on both ends. They would want to, you know, they would constantly be watching, okay, which side is getting stronger, which side is getting more support, what are others doing? And, you know, to say, okay, I'm going to sell one or sell the other. I mean, even when with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, and I think this would be a much, much bigger event. It's also a... not clear whether exchanges are ready for that. I mean, I, no exchange uh, are, has really made a statement that uh, they are ready for, for trading uh, both coins. This is not so easy. Be, uh, it's not just exchanges, but also payment processors. And, and there are some uh, legal issues as, associated with that. What is the definition for, of a Bitcoin if there is a fork? Uh, because uh, their terms of use uh, refer to, to Bitcoin, but uh, they did not uh, probably, uh, uh, they did not uh, planify for this. Of course, the incentive on exchange is extremely strong to support both coins. I mean, we saw that in Ethereum. Oh, yeah. It's just going to, it might not be instant. It might take a few days until they can support both. What's interesting is that this, this incentive of exchanges to support both coins in some ways you might be at odds with the, the health of the ecosystem because if you have you know, coins that are uh, significantly, uh, that have significantly less support, let's say there's like three forks and uh, one of these coins has significantly less support and is insecure, you know, you're sort of, as, as an exchange, you have an incentive to support that coin but um, you're only further sort of, you know, dividing. You're, you're, you're as an exchange, you're only um, encouraging this sort of division in the community uh, for your no, own. No, I, I don't. Uh, I don't agree. I think if there is a, a split of the blockchain, uh, the feedback 
through the price is the only way users have a word in this debate. Otherwise, it's uh, the control is only with the miners. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, and if the one of the blockchains is uh, does not have enough uh, hashing power uh, and is constantly orphaned by uh, miners from the other camp, then uh, users have no no way to to exert any feedback. So you're saying then the market is sort of a a, a signaling mechanisms to a signaling signaling mechanism. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so of course, to see yeah. the 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 the, sort of the value of the. Uh, the real value of the of the chain. Well, that's the idea uh, behind the user activated soft fork. Okay, actually. so let's move on to that topic then. Let's uh, let's go into the user activated soft fork. Um, so this is a, a topic that has come up in in the last few weeks, I think. So what, can you explain what the user activated soft fork is as opposed to the the miner activated soft fork, and in what context are we seeing this c come up now within the broader scaling debate? Yes, of course. Uh, just to, to finish on BU and the hard fork, uh, in both cases, uh, if there are two chains that are living for an, uh, an extended period of time, then the coins will be traded and the markets will be the feedback. Uh, but in yeah, in the user activated soft fork, um, the idea is that uh, you trigger a soft fork uh, regardless of the the consensus that has been reached among miners. Um, so there is a date that has been set by the proponents of uh, UASF, which is the 1st of August. And uh, so on this date, uh, the nodes that do support uh, UASF are going to require that all the new blocks signal for, for SegWit. Okay, so UASF, if we just sort of explain at a high level, right, right now as it stands for these for SegWit and Bitcoin Unlimited, m the way that we get uh, a, a, a approval is through miners signaling in their blocks which version they're supporting. Here, we're giving that choice to users, uh, so full notes, presumably. Full notes, yeah. um, and they would sort of si signal by voting with their software what, uh, what, per you know, what version they want to to be activated on this on this sunset date, which is August first, and at that time, miners would need to start mining blocks compatible with that proposal. Otherwise, they would simply be invalidated. Yes, um, the idea of a user activated soft fork is not new. Actually, um, uh, setting a date or, or, or a block height in order to to um, activate a fork has already been done in the past. Um, but the situation is new because there is no consensus. So this is why I, I'm, uh, I'm saying that uh, we are in a new situation where a soft fork uh, is uh, proposed. Uh, I mean, it is the user activated soft fork is proposed as a way to bypass the lack of uh, consensus. And this is new. Um, and so the idea behind it is that uh, there is a consensus within uh, the economy. So the, the, the economy supports SegWit. And if the miners uh, do not want to activate it... Who, who is uh, the economy? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, who is the economy? Uh, in the end, uh, the, this kind of feedback can only come from markets. And we cannot predict in advance if it's going to work or not. So there's not enough minor support, and so therefore we're turning to the, the, the community or the economy to make that decision. Is, is that sort of the idea? Well, the idea is that um, uh, if there is a soft fork, either it will be with 50, more than 50% or less. If it's mo with more than 50%, then the other chain is open. If they start with less than 50%, uh, the idea is that uh, by having this feedback from the market, um, they, the coin on this side of the fork would have more value than the, on, the, on the side that did not uh, do the soft fork. And therefore, eventually, this side of the, this branch of the fork, the, 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 the soft forking branch, would have more value. Uh, therefore, it would have more, uh, more proof of work, and uh, the other branch would be of front. So then uh, the idea is also that uh, miners should uh, take this into account and uh, switch as soon as possible because they, if they 
acknowledge that uh, most economic actors want this uh, this uh, software to take place, they should follow. So, so right now, user activated soft fork is it's mostly focused on on implementing SegWit. Uh, is this something that is this a mechanism that we could use for other proposals in the future? I don't know, like some other BIP. Yes, of course. It, it's uh, so stricto sensu. It has already been used in the past. It's never been used in a situation uh, where there is no consensus. So we are talking about a situation where there is a risk of uh, splitting the blockchain by doing that. Okay. Well, again, when you say there's no consensus, uh, are, are, you, are you saying that... There is it, no consensus it, it, among miners, yeah. Okay. So the, the, the way I'm seeing this is that the, the people backing SegWit can't get consensus from miners, and so therefore they're turning to the, commu to the economy to try exactly. to get consensus. So exactly. it's like, you know, it's like a kid like asking his dad for something, and like, that's like, you know, and so he goes to see his mom. <laughs> yeah, you, you can put it like that. But uh, the claim... I mean, the belief is that uh, the economy will value this coin more because it has more utility. Sure. That, I mean, that may, that may be true. That may not be true. Who knows, right? But I must say, I find the, the terms being used a bit deceptive because, like, I mean, user activated is, I mean, it's not really user activated, right? Yes, I mean, it is. Uh, it's, uh, it's not minor activated. It's activated by people who are running a node. Um, which are not most users, right? The vast no, majority of Bitcoin holders don't run nodes. That's true, but uh, wallet providers like Electron, uh, we, uh, we are going to give users a choice. Uh, so, uh, so in the end, users can decide which coin have value. And how would they do that if they're running an SPV client in the case of Electron? Yeah. It's exactly the same uh, as uh, as with the hard fork of uh, in the situation of BU. There, if there is a, a split of the blockchain, uh, you would need to to separate your coins in both cases. It would it would uh, it would be very similar. But so so you you could have this choice after this fork, but you don't actually have any choice when it comes to the activation. I think that's that's where my uh, objection is. No, uh, when the activation comes. I think the most important uh, variable is actually the hashing power that goes to the fork. If there is not enough hashing power in the in the forking branch, then it will be uh, vulnerable to attacks. Uh, so it it remains a minor thing until the until the, the fork happens. Now, one thing I was thinking about earlier, and I don't know if this is a, an issue, if there's a way to mitigate this, but it seems like a pretty simple attack vector for this user-activated software for anybody who wanted to really you know, push uh, a proposal through would be to activate a whole bunch of Bitcoin full nodes, which you know, presumably you can do for pretty cheap. You can't do that like on the on the minor activated fork. You know, for, yeah, for but the, the, the user activated software is not a, a node voting. Not a, there is no there is no vote there. It's just a date that has been decided by uh, by the people who started this. It it doesn't matter to to run nodes uh, many nodes. The what really matters is uh, how how much people are using these nodes. Uh, if exchanges are using them, what are the exchanges uh, defining as Bitcoin? Are they going to say that Bitcoin is the, the, the version that has that is following the fork or the other one? These are the questions that are essential. But couldn't and, you and merchants, just run a whole, like if you were, couldn't, couldn't you spawn uh, a whole lot of nodes um, supporting, you know, SegWit, for instance? Could, couldn't one person do that or a group of people do that? Yes. Uh, yeah, and you could also also uh, not propagate blocks uh, that are non segwit Yeah, you can do that. Uh, but if the if the if the miners that are against segwit are well connected, they they will uh, find a way to propagate their blocks uh, between uh, between themselves. Yeah. So that's not such a significant action. Um, no. I, I agree. And so just just to iterate here on yeah why, why is it why does the mining uh, hashing power matter here because if you have this split right if you have this user activated software branch if you have the other branch if the user activated software branch for example only has ten percent of the hashing power it means that 
instead of having a block every uh, 10 minutes until the difficulty reset, which might be two weeks or, you know, generally two weeks, right? They would only have a block every 100 minutes, right? And, and, and then at the same time, you'd have a, a big increase in the demand of transactions because people would want to move their coins to exchanges to be able to trade, you know, to yeah. Uh, so, and it will so that, it will yeah. it will be more than two weeks if you have only ten percent. Right, exactly. So then it will take actually twenty weeks uh, until <laughs> uh, the reset. So. Yes, yes, pretty much. So uh, so that's why I think it's not uh, reasonable to do this with ten percent. Uh, also, because uh, your your blocks can be easily found by uh, hosting miners. Uh, the blocks on on the on the forking branch can be undone and replaced by empty blocks. Uh, if, so, if, they, if they have 90%, yeah. they can afford to do that. So shouldn't it be part of that proposal to say, okay, but the user-activated software maybe only triggers if, you know, let's say 40% of the mining power or something like that uh, do support it? Yes, I, actually, this is a, uh, I mean, I made a proposal that, uh, that goes in this sense. I think currently uh, the, the signaling of the segregated witness software uh, only works with 95%. And uh, I think instead of uh, having only a date, uh, we should maybe have a, a minor activated soft fork uh, with less than 95% and uh, with a result that uh, miners uh, uh, communicate and decide. Uh, because In the current system of BIP9, uh, miners who signal that they are going to activate SegWit, they are not just saying that. They are saying, OK, I'm going to soft fork if there is 95% of agreement. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they would be really to soft fork with 30%. Uh, with 30%, the risk is much higher. And uh, the miners who currently signal for SegWit, their signal that they are willing to follow a fork with a wide consensus. They are not saying I'm, I'm taking this risk as, at 30%. So yeah, uh, I think uh, if we want to activate a soft fork with a 35%, for example, which uh, I consider kind of in the safe zone, uh, then uh, we need a coordination mechanism between the miners that are willing to do that. And uh, this would be uh, achieved by uh, signaling at which threshold you are willing to, to soft fork. Uh, so instead of uh, having just a single bit for the fork, you would have uh, multiple bits and you would encode uh, what, is the, what is the threshold at which you, you want to, to soft fork. And then this information is public because it's uh, in the blocks of all the miners who want to soft fork and they can coordinate, they can decide uh, to change that result according to what other miners do. I mean, I, I think what's interesting about this proposal, even though, I mean, it's a soft fork, it still ends up in, you know, two Bitcoins, right? And, and it seems like any kind of scenario we talk about here, whether it's, you know, Bitcoin Unlimited gaining a majority, starting mining bigger blocks, well, that will probably uh, result in two Bitcoins. This year will probably result in two Bitcoins, right? So it, do, do you think that's inevitable or do you see a path where, you know, the current Bitcoin community somehow gets together and somehow finds some path forward where there's still going to be the Bitcoin and, and everybody agrees on what Bitcoin is when they talk about Bitcoin, you know, there's one network, your coins. I don't know if uh, a fork is going to happen. Uh, this uh, this user activated software pro proposal actually was not uh, supported by Greg Maxwell recently. He made a, a statement that he did not support that, and I think uh, it might be seriously weakened by by that. Um, so we will have to see how things develop. Um, of course, uh, I, I perfectly I, I perfectly understand why uh, most of the core developers do not want uh, a fork of the blockchain. I mean, a split, not not a, a non a fork a fork without a consensus. Uh, it would be highly disruptive, and uh, it would uh, it would be uh, bad for for the ecosystem. The question is, what is worse, uh, waiting? Uh, 
two, three more years or, or uh, finding a, a rapid solution. Yeah, I mean, th this is one thing I really struggle to understand is why there isn't some kind of, uh, why there isn't more willingness to compromise, right? To say like, okay, we do a hard fork, we do SegWit and we do like, I don't know, whatever, four megabyte blocks or something like that, you know, where yeah. both sides, uh, you know, both sides can save their face because I think that's a huge thing too because there's so much in their positions, right? Like nobody can really... Uh, just go with the other side, right? Because that will look like uh, one one side is really lost, whether that's the core developers, and that would be uh, that would certainly be a shame, right? If if also a lot of people might leave the Bitcoin community, might stop developing, which has already happened, right? A lot of people have left, you know, from people like Mike Kern, uh, or Gavin Andreessen, who's I don't know maybe semi left or something, uh, and, I, and I think that's that's really a, a big loss, right? So somehow some way forward where both sides can say okay we got at least a little bit of what we wanted and i, I think that's the only way forward to actually progress bitcoin right so it it can move forward and, and also keep this thing together yes the problem is that uh what is a compromise uh for example there is this proposal uh, segwit plus two megabytes uh, which is a proposal to do the, the circuit soft fork now and to have later a hard fork for the non-witness part of the block. I don't think it's uh, in the interest of miners to accept that because if they do the soft fork, they have no guarantee that it's actually going to be followed by the hard fork. And also the willingness to compromise, to find a compromise is uh, good as long as... Uh, you do not uh, give up something essential. I think the core developers do not want a hard fork because it creates, it might create two coins uh, permanently. Uh, a soft fork uh, at least can offend the, the, the other part of the branch. And also... Um, but but with... this, is, this seems like absurd to me because if you, let's say the core developer says, okay, we support hard fork to two megabytes you know, now so that miners have the assurance, you know, at the same time you do hard fork and segwit. I mean, if they supported that and, and the majority of miners got on board, you know, that would probably work, right? So the idea that you're against that because it can create two coins, but then user activated soft fork, which is definitely going to create two coins. Yeah, I don't think it's the same people who are behind the... Uh, uh... Uh, the rejection of hard forks and the user-activated soft fork. Uh, user-activated soft fork without consensus is very risky. The question is, is, it, is this risk worth taking? And uh, how big is it? Uh, we don't know that until, uh, until uh, we can uh, have an idea of uh, how many miners are going to follow the soft fork. The core developers have designed SegWit in a way that is highly non-disruptive. Um, so if you are a miner and you don't want to implement SegWit right now, you can still mine non-SegWit block and they are still valid with SegWit. Uh, of course, uh, your block might be invalid if you, if, uh, you have uh, some transactions in it that, uh, um, that are SegWit transactions. And, uh, but uh, this should not happen uh, due to the propagation rules. Uh, it would only happen if you mine on top of another block that has been uh, mined by a malicious uh, miner. But it can happen. Well, so uh, my point is that the core developers have, re have really done the maximum to make uh, SegWit uh, uh, non-risky. I can understand that they do not want to risk a split of the chain. It's of the course. same. I mean, yeah. I, as a, as a, I'm uh, I'm the developing Electrum, and uh, I always keep saying that Electrum is neutral. Uh, you can you can be for BU, you can be pro or against Segwit, you can still run an Electrum node. So the the software that I write is agnostic, and uh, this is because Electrum is a decentralized system. When you are developing a, de a decentralized system, you do not want to to uh, split apart from uh, one part of the community. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. And, and I, I mean, uh, uh, I also completely understand, for example, I, I you know, read Greg Maxwell's thing on 
being against the user activated soft fork as well. I mean, at least it's consistent, I think, with uh, the sort of view, okay, we got to be conservative and, uh, and we have to make sure that there is some kind of consensus because it seems extremely hypocritical to me if you're going to, you know, criticize bigger blocks or, you know, a block size increase because it doesn't have consensus, but then you are in favor of something like user activated software. That doesn't seem like a, a intellectually consistent position to hold. So but make, are, are there people yeah. holding this position? I'm not sure. Maybe not. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about this whole thing? Do you feel frustrated? I mean, you've been in the Bitcoin space for a very long time. Have you ever, are, are you, do you start to question whether this project has a future or are you still, you think it's going to be resolved? I certainly feel less frustrated than the core developers who have been developing segregated witness and who see that uh, this is not uh, getting implemented uh, because it's their baby sort of and uh, it's like your, your baby is getting rejected. So uh, I have much less uh, frustration, I guess, uh, than them. And uh, yeah, well, I, I'm excited by this uh, idea of uh, Lightning Network and payment channels, and I would like to, to see them happen. So this is why I'm frustrated, but I have not really uh, spent uh, hundreds of hours of my time already on that. So yeah, well. Let, let's imagine that Segregated Witness does get implemented and, and we get all the benefits from that. and. Uh, that Lightning Networks also gets it's It's going to happen on Litecoin very likely. Okay. Well, perhaps that's a, that's a good test bed then. I mean, my, yeah. my question was going to be, let's flash forward, you know, th four years and uh, hypothetically, both of these things are now running and 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 um, and, and tested and, and are sort of, you know, um, yeah, used. Like what, 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 what do you think the network would look like? What do you think the ecosystem would look like then? Oh, it will certainly be disruptive uh, for the ecosystem because uh, the the big players w might be different. Uh, I'm a wallet developer and uh, I'm not uh, Lightning Network ready, so I, I'm I'm trying to to do to be ready as fast as possible. But um, yeah, well, so Electrum is already supporting a segregated witness, but of course um, nobody at this point has a really um, user-friendly version of the Lightning Network. It doesn't mean that Lightning does not exist. Actually, a few weeks ago, uh, there was a Lightning transaction here in Berlin at the Room 77 restaurant to pay for a beer using tested Bitcoins. Uh, so they made a, a demonstration of that uh, in, uh, during this uh, developer workshop. So Lightning does exist. And uh, I, I'm testing it. I have used uh, the Lightning uh, Diamond. I'm uh, studying the code. But uh, yeah, well, um, the, it's uh, obvious that um, wallet providers will have to adapt or, or maybe they will no longer exist. Yeah. And uh, then payment providers as well. Even this, for them, it's probably less, uh, less of a change. They, they actually use uh, wallets. Do you think that so the, these solutions being implemented on, on Litecoin may serve the Bitcoin community as some sort of a, a feedback mechanism, you know, something they can look at and say, okay, well, this is, these, this is the results that we get on, on, on this other blockchain, um, yeah, you know, whether it's positive or negative. Do you think maybe that's one uh, way forward? That might be the case, yes. Actually, the first feedback that we get is that the price of Litecoin is correlated with the number of miners that signal for Segwit. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's pretty obvious, right? That this is a, a big opportunity for Litecoin potentially, because uh, if if this continues to stall, let's say Segwit does get act activated there, you know, for for Bitcoin developers, it's easy to sort of. Litecoin is very close to Bitcoin. The the changes are very small. It's not like uh, Bitcoin Unlimited who decided to fork the project and to to discard all the new developments of the core development of the core developers. Litecoin is just a small patch over Bitcoin. So the, the development efforts that are made for Litecoin can benefit to Bitcoin. Exactly. No, no, I totally understand that. But you can still have the situation that, you know, maybe this would be looked at, okay, it's just like temporary thing and we're just going to develop on, 
uh, with SegWit on Litecoin under the assumption that uh, Bitcoin is also going to activate SegWit. But if then that doesn't happen, and then you know one year later you're still developing on Litecoin, I mean all of a sudden you could have a shift there. Yeah, that's I I think. I totally agree with you, and I wish this uh, was taken more seriously by some of the core developers. So we're, we're almost at the end, but briefly, you had in Berlin uh, a workshop with uh, many of the wallet developers. They all came together. You organized that to talk about you know, news in Bitcoin development. C can you share a bit? What are your main takeaways from that workshop? Oh, it was very nice. Uh, we did not really talk about soft forks and hard forks. That was not the topic of the discussion because, uh, yeah, well, uh, this uh, this um, workshop was organized by uh, was initiated by Matt Corallo, and the I guess one of the main drivers was uh, to discuss um, standards and compatibility b between wallets, especially in the context of uh, the changes that are necessary to to make for segregated witness. Uh, with SegWit, the format of transactions is a bit different, and uh, especially for hardware wallets, uh, you you can uh, check uh, the input amounts more easily. You don't need to to send the whole set of uh, input transactions to the to the hardware wallet. So we were we have been mostly talking about uh, standardization of uh, communication and uh, between wallets. Yes. And of course, uh, we, we talked a little bit about the USF, but it was only on the coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Well, uh, Thomas, thanks so much for coming on. I mean, it's, this is an endless topic, and I'm sure it's going to stay with us for, for a long time. It doesn't have any signs of, uh, of going away. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it was very nice to, to see you guys again. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it, it does hold the promise, I don't know if we want that, that uh, Bitcoin could become an incredibly uh, incredibly interesting place, right? If we have a soft fork, coin chain splitting, replay attacks, you no, know, no, I all think of no, that no, excitement. Nobody wishes that. I believe that the, the proponents of the user-activated soft fork actually uh, expect this to have a, a, a deterrent effect on the miners, so that they will gain, they will have fifty percent from the start. Uh, this might be wishful thinking. I don't know, but this is uh, this is the bet that they are doing. That at least if there is a split, it's not going to last for a long time. I mean, that sounds like wishful thinking. And 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 even if they do have fifty percent, then well, there's another chain also with fifty percent, right? So no, uh, if they do have more than fifty percent. Unless the other chain ma makes a hard fork, then the, 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 the other chain doesn't uh, keep... Uh, it, it's, it's getting all fun. Yeah, that's true. It's more the the miners will, will jump to the longer chain. Okay, well, uh, thanks so much, Thomas. Well, uh, thanks so much for your work also with Electrum. Um... <laughs> it's not only my work. It's nice. And yeah, thanks so much for listening, for once again uh, tuning in. We are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. So in the Let's Talk Network, you can find this show and other shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. And if you want to support the show, then uh, you can do so by uh, leaving us an iTunes review or, or giving us a tip in uh, Bitcoin or Ether. And yeah, thanks so much. We look forward to being back next week. Thank you.